Hello, Mr. Wickham. Hi. Hi How are you doing? Can you hear us? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Holly, we will. You need to share your screen during the presentation. Uh, I don't have any slides or anything prepared. I can show. I, I can show uh, some websites and stuff as needed. But I think most of the time would just be me chatting. Okay. Okay. No, that's okay. We didn't. Uh, was um, you weren't expecting any presentation? We just wanted to have a talk with you. It's a. Uh, I'll just start uh, thanking you for uh, scheduling some time for us. And I would like to uh, thank our attendance of our students, the INSPIR data members, and our professor of data analysis at INSPIR, Paulo Marques, which was a major influence for us at our student club. And I would like to start talking about a little bit about INSPIR data and then ask, ask my dear friend Gustavo, which was a founder of this, uh, this student club to talk to us, uh, to explain to you a little bit what we do here. Okay, so basically INSPIR Data is a student group from INSPIR, which is focused on data science. So it was founded on 2020, and it is a place where students can develop their programming skills and apply them to topics such as economics, business, law, etc. So in the past two years, the student group helped over 40 people to study the effectiveness of education-related NGOs to develop solutions for companies such as the Stone Group and Motu, and to publish papers on the effects of COVID in regions with different income in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, Inspire Data's journey started with, the, with your, uh, the study of your work, Mr. Wickham. So, uh, and it continues to support us with tools that make complex statistical analysis and data wrangling an accessible process to many of us. So for that reason, we are very happy to have you here. Thank you. For those uh, in the audience who are not familiar with data science and the guys behind the tools we use, uh, Hadley Wickham is a, the chief scientist at R Studio Incorporated today and adjunct, adjunct professor of statistics at the University of Auckland, Stanford, and Rice University. Correct me, Hadley, if I get anything wrong. Yeah. And he's the author of many books uh, related to R, including that what we know the R for data science, I think it's O'Reilly uh, collection, and it has developed a widely used set of R, R libraries known collectively as the Tidyverse. Uh, I think the main one being GDPlot2 and DeployR that we use almost every day. And yeah. uh, in 2006, he was awarded the John Chambers Award for Statistical Computing for his work. Uh, and was named a fellow of the American Statistical Associa Association in 2015. He was also awarded in 2019 the International uh, President's Award of Statistical, Statistical Societies for his inflation work, and I'm quoting here, uh, in statistical computing, visualization, graphics, and data analysis, including uh, making statistical thinking and computing accessible to a large audience. And I think we are included in that large audience. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I would like to ask you, Mr. Wickham, uh, here at the INSPIRT, a lot of students use R Studio on a daily basis. Uh, so please tell us about your role and work at R Studio and the long-term mission uh, of the company. Yeah, so thanks for that intro. Um, so I'm the, the chief scientist and I don't really know what that title means because uh, I don't think I really do any science, but uh, I kind of oversee the sort of open source teams at our studio um so the, those are like the, the the tidyverse team who's responsible for not only the tidyverse but also the packages we use to develop the tidyverse uh the tidy models team who are developing uh, modeling packages that work in the kind of tidy data and tidy api framework uh the the r markdown and quarto teams which is kind of co-run with uh, jj alia and the shiny team which joe ching runs and then uh the mlverse team that works on things like spark and torch and keras and various other kind of tools for basically connecting r to other important platforms and just a, so, little, a little follow up question on, on this matter. Uh, how does it work in this relation with the open source and a private team uh, working with code? And how does that, does that work? 
Yeah, so pretty much everyone on the open source side is like exclusively open source. So we only develop open source teams, open source code. There are also teams that are kind of like on the, the sort of hybrids, so like the IDE team. It's like some of that, you know, some of that team produces the open source IDE, but they also work on our commercial product, our studio workbench, which makes it easy to run like not just our studio and your organization, but also like Jupyter Notebooks and, um, and VS Code. So that's sort of a hybrid team. And then there's also teams that are like 100% commercial, work on our commercial products like our studio Connect and um, our studio Package Manager. So, so by and large, we're kind of most people either work on open source or um, commercial products, but there are a few people on the IDE team who do a little bit of, little bit of both. I think generally our goal as a company is to kind of make as much open source as we possibly can and then find the bits that like big companies find particularly valuable and then make the big companies who have lots of money pay lots of money for those features so we can make, make the, the rest of it, you know, free to the world. Okay, uh, I think Paulo, we can move to the questions that uh, the students sent. Okay, so during this talk, just remember members of the audience can send their questions to the hosts using the chat button. So, okay, Hadley, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. This first question was asked by one of the students. He's asking about recollections of your first experiences with computer programming. Yeah, so I started programming probably when I was around 15. Um, so my, uh, my dad, uh, worked with computers a lot. I remember he, he used, and he'd always, so we had, we had computers at home. Um, and I remember him kind of having one of the first like laptop computers, which you couldn't actually fit in your lap. It was like giant and heavy and hard to move around and had like a one color screen. So I, I kind of started, you know, I was, always had those kind of at home when I was a kid. And I guess when I was around 15, I sort of started to get interested in uh, databases. And uh, I used uh, Microsoft Access and kind of got interested in, 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 in making databases and writing a little bit of Visual Basic code for those. And that was actually my, like my first job when I was in high school was writing documentation for databases. And then a little bit later, I started kind of developing databases on my own as sort of a, a part-time job. So that was, yeah. So I really started with um, Microsoft Access and Visual Basic. A little bit later, I got into um, the web and learned uh, PHP, which is a language for developing web applications. And that was kind of my part-time job uh, during university. And that's when I sort of started to learn about R and got really in into that. Okay, uh, second question is, is about the development of the Tidyverse libraries. We know that Tidyverse libraries are strongly grounded on the abstraction described in three of your academic papers. So I guess the question is about your personal journey from the identification of those key unifying data analysis principles and the subsequent development of the Tidyverse libraries over the years. Yeah, I think the thing that really so a lot of these, a lot of the ideas kind of predate the idea of the tidyverse. Like the tidyverse was kind of like, I sort of realized, well, we need a name to kind of wrap up, wrap up the wrap up the ideas. But most of the kind of development happened before the idea of the, the, the tidyverse existed. And the thing that I think really drove a lot of my work, and to some extent still drives my work, was when I was a, a PhD student instead of having like a research assistantship or a teaching assistantship or I helped with research or teaching, I had a consulting assistantship. And so what my job was, was to basically help PhD students from other departments analyze their data. And that was really eye-opening to me because in all of like my statistics courses, we focused on like statistical modeling and like how do you like find the right model for the data? And when I said, but when I started to work with these people, I was like, well, that's not the first problem. The first problem is like, how do I get this data into R and out of like whatever crazy format that I've stored it in into something that I can actually work with and, um, you know, can feed into the model. So it really felt like 
the modeling part was like easy. Like once I got the right the data, the right data into the right format, the modeling was easy. But like no one in statistics seemed to be kind of like thinking about or talking about this problem of of, of getting the getting the data in, in the right format. And that's what led to the reshape package, which eventually became reshape two and and, and tidy R and the, the ideas of tidy data. Um, but there's still I um you know, there's, there's still like Excel spreadsheets from that time that other people provided to me that I vividly remember is just like blowing my mind. Like, why would anyone ever store like data like this? Um, which you know, sort of another, you know, I think failing of statistics education, like no one was teaching, you know, PhD students how to collect data and how to organize it in a way that uh, was useful for analysis. And that just, yeah, that, that really kind of set the scene for so much of my work afterwards. And was it well received at the time? Because you were talking that it, it, it was quite a new field of study. So how did people perceive it at the time? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I think like practitioners like really understood how useful it was. Uh, it was much, it was very difficult, you know, as a PhD student at the time and then an assistant professor, it was much more difficult to kind of publish this stuff in statistics journals because there was like no, there's like no formulas. I'm not like proving anything. Um, so I think that, and that, you know, that's kind of like my work has always been, I don't know, like it, it, it was very gratifying to, to find like there's actually hundreds of thousands of people with these same problems struggling to find a good answer. And then that that my tools could could help them do that. Um, in some ways, like leaving academia for our studio was kind of a reflection of just like the challenges of trying to publish this sort of applied work and get credit for it. Um, so yeah, it's definitely nice being at our studio and everyone like understands the work I do and why it's important as, to, as opposed to being in the statistics department where it was much that was a story I kind of needed to tell people about like why this stuff was, was useful and they were not necessarily fully on board with it. And still on this question, I think that I would like to ask you, uh, why do you think that uh, our studio has an appeal, uh, especially with the biology community and uh, as I see in the, in, uh, in the forums, uh, it feels like the biology guys love our studio more than the other fields. Uh, why do you, do you think that happened? I don't know. I think some of the time, it's sort of hard to, I don't know, explain these kind of like why some fields use some technologies and um, other fields use different ones. I think some of it is just like maybe the technology is a particularly good fit for the problem. But I think there's also just like a lot of it that's kind of like lack and sort of like founder effects of like one that's it is sort of surprising like how much influence sometimes like the right person like one person talking about their experiences and really kind of saying why they found it to be useful can have a, on, a, on a community um so yeah so i i don't know i there's also there's other communities that kind of i don't know like you know so political science uses our bunch um and it's just i don't know it's hard i think a lot of it's just kind of random chance and some of it some of it's like professors and some of it's like like you know phd students or postdocs who are like really excited and then they make their professors use it or encourage them to, to change or just like slowly kind of chip away like let's try and make this problem easier because most people like most people don't really care about what programming language they're using to do statistics they just want their life to be easier and to, to get the results that they want to get as, as quickly as possible. And I think, I don't know, I feel like quite a, like a, quite a few people in the community kind of understand that. And it's not just about like making some cool package. It's also about like making good documentation, providing a nice website, helping people realize like, why is this going to save them, save them time and effort. And, you know, I think our, our markdown in our quarter is, is a huge, huge, part of that, that that being able to create like you know, reproducibly create documents that combine your writing your code and the results of that code is just incredibly incredibly 
compelling. And the community created around our, our studio and the Tidyverse was really crucial, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the community, it's sort of funny. Like when I started using R, uh, the community did not have a good reputation. It was sort of all around this, like the R help mailing list, or if you asked a dumb question, some famous professor a little would harsh. Like call you out on it. Um, but now I think it's really transformed um, sort of over time with like Stack Overflow and Twitter and just this really like positive community where, you know, by and large, everyone's trying to help everyone, you know, get better. It's like a, everyone understands that data science is like hard, programming is hard. We don't need to make it even harder by being mean to one another. <laughs> okay. So any follow-ups, Vinicius and Gustavo, no? Okay, so another question sent by uh, one of the students. Oh, I guess this one is kind of inevitable. So how do you see the relation between R and Python as data analysis tools? Uh, is there room for cooperation between developers of both languages? Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, we are in R Studio, you know, like our commercial products are increasingly supporting both R and Python, you know, like our, our studios kind of commercial products aren't written in R anyway, they're written in other languages like Go and uh, JavaScript. And the, uh, you know, we just want to make sure teams of data scientists can do their jobs as, as easily as possible. I think our vision originally was like, let's help teams of R data scientists do their jobs as easy as possible, but you know, there's, relatively few teams that are 100% R. There's lots of teams that are a mix of R and Python. And really our vision has kind of grown to, to, to include those teams as well. You know, I think in the long run, um, we'd like to be able to say like, even if you're 100%, your team is 100% Python, um, R Studio has useful tools for you as well. Um, I think we're a little ways away from that yet, but we're kind of heading in, in that direction. Uh, open, like open source, it's sort of harder to, um, it's harder for me to see how that's going to change, but we definitely have more and more initiatives that, you know, kind of treating R and, and Python equally. A good example of that is Quarto, um, which you may have heard about or not, but it's kind of the successor to R Markdown. And it's really like our markdown, like given that you, you could always use Python, you've been able to use Python and our markdown for some time, but even just the name like our markdown kind of suggests that, that R is going to be easier than Python. Uh, Quarto is kind of a like modern reimagining of all of this tooling that puts, you know, R and Python and, and JavaScript on kind of equal footings. Uh, and I think is you know just one of the things that we're we're doing to to kind of build bridges between the the communities. There's you know lots of other great tools. Um, and another R Studio thing is Articulate, which makes it really easy to call Python code from with R. On the other side, there's a community project called RPy2, which lets you call uh, R code from Python. Uh, lots of modern tools now kind of have the same computational backend, like written in C or C++ or some other high performance language, you know, that that's how like most of the modern machine learning platforms like Torch or Keras work. You express your ideas in some high level language like R or Python, and it gets compiled down into some efficient low level language. So I think we're just going to see more and more work there, more and more collaboration. So any follow-ups, Gustavo, Vinicius? Okay, so what do you have here? Let's see. Okay, this is a little polemic. So uh, this is another question sent by one of the students. Uh, he says, we live in an era of almost universal availability of open source implementations of an incredible range of sophisticated statistical and machine learning models and algorithms. So what can be done by the R community to mitigate the risk of people making bad decisions when using these tools without proper understanding of the underlying concepts. Yeah, this is a challenging one. I, and I kind of, I wrote like a while ago, this sort of life lighthearted paper about this that talks about, like, I think in particular, a lot of statisticians kind of preach statistical abstinence. 
like you shouldn't do statistics unless you're in a long committed long-term relationship with a statistician because otherwise you're going to like hurt yourself uh and statistical abstinence that's not very works. realistic right yeah right it works as well as abstinence does as a as a, a, a practice in, in general life so I, I think to me it's more about like how do how do we help people practice safe stats like how do we kind of like build up the sort of guardrails that like you know kind of point people generally in the right direction uh and how do we kind of develop that in, into our tooling uh like i think one one way that like the tidy moles team has done this which i think is really important is that like forcing you to kind of consider how you're going to split up your data into like training and test sets like very very early on in your analysis like how do you make sure that you don't end up overfitting your models so they do really really well on that specific data set you have but don't generalize very well and I, you know i think we've known for like a, a long time that that's good practice to make sure you reserve some of your data to that you're not fitting your models to that you're not using in that initial data initial analysis but just making sure that that's kind of like you almost like forced to start there by the way you have to interact with the, the rest of the package. Uh, so I, I think it's like thinking about things like that, like how do we help people make good decisions by default while still giving them the freedom to explore and do things that maybe you know, don't make sense in general, but might make sense for your particular problem. And then just generally, I think like you, giving people like more knowledge and more skills and better tools like that's always better than the opposite of like trying to sh shut them down and only allow like professionals or experts to do it so what i hear about this I, I don't know if it's a good idea or not but to almost have a a link to summer explaining the models in the document uh, in the documentation so if you want to use a random forest regression, you if you look at the documentation, you can see what's the random forest and where you can use it in. Yeah, some of that's yeah, some of that is like surprisingly hard to do because you really need to take, you know, like a, to really understand. Like you can use, you can learn how to use random forests in like 15 minutes, but to understand how they really work and like what the edge cases are of all these techniques can be like quite tough. Um, I think there are also um, sort of general tools for doing like kind of model, uh, like using creating visualizations of the model that help you understand what the model is doing without you having to learn about how all of the, the mathematics behind it works. Uh, and I think there's some, um, you know, also just thinking about like, how do you monitor models? How do you get feedback about whether they're doing well or not is, is really important. And I think a pretty active area of research still as well. I think also uh, our markdown may have a role in this because it encourages people to document their analysis, not just the, just just uh, just the code, and to talk about yeah. what they're exactly doing their choices. Okay. Yeah, I mean reproducibility obviously is just so key as well. Like being able to like publish, like here is exactly how I got to these findings, is so valuable for that. That. Um, the like iteration that other people like look at your you look at your code and you know are a little bit critical or critical of it or give you some critiques so that you can kind of you can go back and, and make it better but i think it's also thinking about it's not just doing this like one-off analysis it's about engaging with the community like sh you know showing what you've done getting feedback making it better and you know that you don't have to be perfect in the the first go round that you're you're connected to this community of people who are both like supportive and like willing to like really look at the the alert you of the problems so that you can you can make the whole thing better. I think you know that's kind of the idea of um, you know the whole sort of journal publishing process of getting external reviewers to look at it and and criticize it and sometimes that works really well and sometimes it does not and recently it's kind of becoming mandatory to to do uh, everything in a reproducible way right in, in many areas of science 
Yeah, it's more, I mean, there's been culture so, of so many, so many instances of just like really, you know, silly mistakes that could have been caught by making the code, you know, available to everyone. And I think that culture yeah. of openness is just spreading throughout. Caught in the, so the raw data, also, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any any follow ups, Gustavo and Vinicius? Okay. So we can follow. So, uh another question from the students uh, i'm not a programmer wizard a programming wizard uh, i'm not a programming wizard how can i effectively contribute to the development of r and the tidyverse so i think there are uh, there's lots of ways so one way is to like like get really good like get find bugs and get good at reporting them. And I think like one of the skills that's kind of related to programming, but a little bit independent is like the art of creating a good reprex or reproducible example. Like how can you find like the smallest nugget of code that demonstrates the problem where if you removed a single line of that code, you, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't still wouldn't see the problem. Uh, and I think that that is like so valuable and you can do that. You can do that like with problems that you discover. Uh, and a lot of the times, like the process of creating that reprex, that reproducible example, that can sometimes help like figure out like maybe that's not actually a bug. Maybe you were thinking about it quite slightly incorrectly. Um, but even like, by, but once you've got that reprex, it's so much easier for, for me and other developers to kind of like go in and figure out what's actually gone wrong. And you can do that with your own bugs. You can also like look at issues uh, that other people have filed that maybe have, that have got like 80 lines of code and you can like take that and kind of play around with it yourself and see if you can make it smaller. And you know, that that's not easy when you're not necessarily familiar with how the package works, but that can be kind of a great learning experience because you can do a lot by trial and error. You can like, well, is this big long complicated expression if i just replace it with a constant do i still see the problem if you do then you know you've simplified one thing and you're going to keep iteratively working on it like that and another way that can be useful is um and that gives you kind of practice with the, the kind of workflow of contributing to packages on github is to find like documentation problems like if you notice a typo in the documentation do a pull request to fix it. Like even if it's like a single letter or it's a, like a missing comma or a missing full stop, um, you know, it's obviously a, that's a small contribution, but it helps you kind of build up those skills. And, uh, it's, you know, a good pull request only takes like a, you know, a minute or two for someone on the team to look over and approve. So it's like a small change, but it's just a small cost for us. And it gives you starts to build up some of those Get and GitHub skills. Um, the, then I think, um, yeah, it starts to get hard. I mean, I, then I think like if you want to contribute, it's a matter of like looking for packages that are a little simpler and easier to understand. Like Dplyr and ggbot2 are like big old packages that like even I have difficulty understanding and it takes me a while to figure out when why things are going wrong and you know a lot of the code exists not because it's the the best way to do things now but that's because the way we did things 10 years ago and it's too hard to change now so i think if you want to contribute like stay away from these really big complicated packages look for kind of the newer smaller well-contained packages you know read through the code you know and then hopefully you can start to think about where you might contribute improvements. So any follow-ups, Gustavo, Vinicius? Okay, so uh, this is a super technical question. Uh, you've put a lot of effort to the development of functional programming tools like the PER R. I don't know if it's PER or PER R library. Per. Per. So what are your expectations about the, the role of functional programming ideas in the future development of data analysis? Yeah, so, so technically the per package, you should roll your R. 
um, but I cannot, as in New Zealand English, there's like no R sounds in it, so I cannot roll my R's. If you can roll your R's, you can like actually purr when you're saying purr. it. Um, but I think like, I, I don't know, I kind of, it, it's funny, like sort of over time, like purr sort of waxes and wanes in my personal popularity. Like it's like such a general tool um and then sometime like often over time like some of the bits where we found it to be really useful as a general tool we developed like specialized tools that that do better and so two examples that come to mind like per is really great if say you have a directory full of csv files and you want to read every single one of them but that's such a useful task we kind of started to build that into our file reading functions so that most of them you can not just give it a single file name but you can give it a vector of file names to read them all in the once and so that was kind of like something that was really useful for per you know still really still easy to do in per but now you don't have to learn per in order to do that so uh, it's integrated in area, VR. Okay. yeah exactly okay another example was like data what we call data rectangling like when you have like a data that's like a tree structure which might be because you've got xml or json or yaml file and you want to get into a data frame and per was great because it's sort of all about iterating on these individual elements like working your way out to the leaves of the tree that have the information and again like that was so useful we started to build more functions for that into tidy r um so that this these these unnest longer and unnest wider functions now can do all sort of specialized tools for um for, for for solving the same problems you could with a general tool per and so like currently it's hard for me to say like like what like what is some concrete data science activity that you need per for um but i still like believe it's really useful i, I think it's mostly useful like when you start to get away from these tool, these things that kind of like everyone is doing, like these things that are like very specific for your analysis, PER just gives you this very general, concise and expressive toolkit for saying like, do this thing a bunch of times to these different data frames or lists or vectors or, or files or whatever. And if you, I mean, there's, there's nothing you can do with PER that you can't do with a for loop. Like there's no, there's like behind the scenes, per is just writing and executing for loops for you. But it's once you get the kind of like the key ideas behind per, instead of having to write this like five lines of for loop code, you might be able to express it in just like a single line with one call to the right per function. And that I think really increases your your speed, your velocity as a programmer, because you often I think are kind of limited still by your like your your typing speed, by the ability to get ideas out of your head and into into the computer. Uh, and Per just gives you a bunch of kind of flexible tools for, for doing that. Um, and it kind of open also the possibility for a parallelization without the user having to to control any finer details, right? Yeah. So there's also this uh, cool package called Fur, um, which is like Fur plus the future package. And there, basically, all you do is instead of calling the Fur function, you call the corresponding Fur function, and it will do the computation across all of the cores in, in your computer. Uh, and yeah, you don't have to do anything except change that one that one name yeah, one and also name. also in terms of teaching i remember your cupcake talk about functional programming using per and, yeah but how how realistic is it for for us to expect that the average programmer will kind of learn how to use these tools why is it so hard for beginners what can we what can you do to make it easier for beginners yeah, I, I don't know. And like, you know, part of the reason that we've worked on these other tools and like Radar and Tidy R is that it does seem like this, this functional programming is harder than some of the other concepts to learn. And so what we've tried to do is make it so you can teach it like kind of later and later in the 
data science, you know, the data science course. I, th I think like a lot of the, the challenge is not necessarily like kind of the functional programming necessarily, but like this idea of functions, like this idea you're going from something like there's some concrete calculation on like variables that you can see like concrete things in front of you to this kind of more abstract notion of like whatever that comes into this function, I'm going to do some calculation with it. And I think that that kind of moving up this ladder of abstraction just in general tends to be tough for people because um, you're no longer like solving you're not just like solving one problem in front of you you're thinking about like how do i solve this sort of imaginary set of future problems uh, and that can be i think a, a tough transition for, for many people which you know again is why we've tried to make it as possible as much as possible to do as much data science as you can without having to, to cross that chasm Okay, so any follow ups, Gustavo Vinicius? Uh, yes, I have in this matter. I, I think that I am one of the students as Mr. Data that didn't get that far on the tidyverse as functional programming and, and were. So uh, I kind of got the idea by your explanation and the questions made by Paulo, but just to get my head around, it's like you make a routine of functions uh, of, of things you want to, to apply up in a database and you make that automatic. Can you explain what is functional programming for us? Yeah, that's basically it. I think it's like doing, it's performing some action on a bunch of different inputs. Uh, again, which is, you know, basically what you do in a for loop. And in a for loop, like everything's very explicit. You're like here, I'm gonna take the first element of this vector and I'm gonna call this function and I'm gonna save the results into this output vector. Then I'm gonna take the second element and apply this function to it and sell the results here. And the thing that's nice about for loops is kind of everything is like spelled out in front of you. And what functional programming does is really just kind of wraps all of those details up in some function that has, you know, like a seven letter name that is moderately cryptic at first. Um, and the yes, yeah, like it's definitely hard to get your head around because it's this abstraction. You're taking away this like very concrete, like do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this of a for loop and putting into this sort of like this machinery that's now happening behind the scenes. And so it's like the death, it's like the death in Python, where you define a function and you came with the variables after. Yeah. Basically, and then about calling that function repeatedly on on and sort of automatically on like every variable in your data set or every file in a in a directory. Um, but again, like I don't know, it's not I don't know. It's, I think functional programming is kind of like a useful. It's not like something that's essential. I think it's something that. It's kind of an incremental improvement like it will help you do things like express ideas a little bit faster i think once you get the ideas in your head it helps you think about things a little bit faster but ultimately it doesn't allow you to do anything you couldn't do before so i i don't think you need to, and it's something you can kind of i don't know it doesn't matter if you don't get it the first time or the second time but maybe you'll get it the third time or the fourth time you use it and then eventually it sticks or maybe it's it never awesome. does and you're Sorry. Just it's also a little bit about that. elegant code, right? In a sense, I, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> much, yeah, much tighter code. And... Yeah, and elegance, I think, is a um, like it's something that is kind of useful. I mean, even elegance is not quite the right. It's like when you're writing, it's kind of like writing. You know, if you're writing for a technical audience, you can use like specific words that mean exactly what you're trying to express that only your audience will understand. If you're writing for a wider audience, you can't use those words because you know they don't know the, the scientific jargon and you're going to kind of spell it out in more detail. And so I think like that's what PER gives you, the sort of language for expressing ideas, allows you to express them much more compactly or elegantly, but only people who know that language are going to be able to understand what you're doing. Okay, just a remind, reminder for people in the audience, please, uh, if you have any questions, send it using the chat button. We have a, a more general kind of last question here for Hadley. 
So a student asks, uh, what's your general advice for young people interested in statistics, data analysis, and programming? I think, like, I guess, like, practice, like, try and find opportunities to practice what you're learning. And I kind of think the, the best way to do that is to find, like, data that you are personally interested in or data about you and practice your skills on that. Like, I, I have quite a few little projects where I like try and like scrape websites that I like or try and get data from data sources that interest me and then that kind of teaches you there's some challenges of getting the data in the first place like some of them like some of the skills are just like learning how to like effectively like what keywords do you google for like trying a bunch of different google queries to find try and find the data that you're that you're interested in in a convenient form. Some of it's learning tools like Arvist or other tools for web scraping. So getting a bunch of web pages and extracting the data from that. Or maybe the data is in an API and learning a little bit about APIs to get the data from there. Um, and, and then like once you've got the data, because it's something you're already interested in or it's about you, then you've got like a bunch of questions already and you can practice using your, you know, dplyr or ggplot2 or whatever skills to, to answer those questions. Um, the other, I think the other thing that's kind of related is like the, the Tidy Tuesday um, program, which um, they, every week they post a um, data set for people just to experiment with and people like play around with it and like show off what they've done on Twitter it's a nice way to just kind of try out, you know, get exposed to a bunch of different data sets, try out some techniques you might not be familiar with and then see what other people have done. I think at least for me, one of, one of the ways that I learned the most ggplot was looking at Twitter, looking at the codes and, oh, that looks nice, what, what did it do? I think it's also important I, to, okay, sorry. Go, Vinicius. And I think we we have to quote here David Robinson with his channel that I absolutely love, and I think you know him hardly or seen his videos, but yeah. uh, he makes he every Tuesday he goes to the challenge, the Tidy Tuesday, I think is the name, and yeah. he goes through making several analyses, and I think that's very helpful to watch and learn. He's very efficient and in writing the code. Okay, I can't, sorry, yeah, asking, I, uh, sorry. Uh, I, I can't resist but asking a final technical question. At some point, you guys decided to move away from C++ in, in some of the libraries. Uh, how, was the, how was that decision, the impacts? At first, people was a little scared that uh, the player would be not be so fast as it is, but that's not the case, right? It's still super fast. And, and can you talk about, a, little about, a little about that decision of moving away from C++? Yeah, we haven't moved enough. I'd say we've moved away from C++ that much. Some of our newer stuff has been written in C instead of C++, not for any, not because like in general C is better than C++, but just for that, those particular domains, it was easier to kind of use C. Um, we have moved away from the RCPP package a little bit towards this newer CPP 11 package, which is kind of solves some, you know, RCPP has you know, been around for, I don't know, over, well over 10 years now. And, you know, C++ has changed a lot in that time. And so the CPP 11 package allows us to kind of take advantage of some of the newer C++ uh, features and solves a few kind of annoying bugs that would have been difficult to fix without breaking our CPP. Um, but yeah, and yeah, I think we're still, I don't know, I've written less C++ lately, but I think that that's just me, not a general reflection on the, on the team. Okay, we have a, uh... One question from the audience here. So he's asking, what do you believe will be the most important changes in the way data scientists interact with data in the next decade? Yeah, I 
I don't know. I don't know if it's, this is probably a little sooner than the next decade, but I think the tools for dealing with like large, large data sets that like still fit on disk on your laptop are going to get much better. Um, I think this is sort of just a combination of like now, you know, most people have laptops that have four cores or eight cores. It's kind of, they have a bunch of memory and a bunch of disk space, maybe using a solid state disk, which are much, much faster than all the um, older hard drives. And I think the tools haven't quite caught up to that yet. I think we're sort of starting to see with like tool pack, tools like Arrow and DuckDB that it's, it's totally feasible that you can be interacting or interactively exploring like gigabytes of data on your laptop. Like you don't need a, you know, you don't need a super powerful central server or a big database server that the, you know, your laptop has the power to, to uh, analyze those data sets if you can kind of effectively harness it. Um, I think there's also sort of some interesting things happening with like Apple's uh, latest laptops in terms of like integrating the memory that the CPU and the GPU uses, which makes it easier to um, do computations on the CPU that the CPU is well suited to and op operations of the GPU that GPU is well suited for. Um, certainly currently there's like lots of special case, special applications where the GPU is just much, much better. But for kind of general data analysis, I don't think it's had much imp impact, partly because like all your data like lives in the CPU memory and if you want to do anything with it on the GPU, you've got to copy all of that data across and that the cost of copying it kind of ends up dominating the, the performance benefits you get otherwise. But if this sort of trend of like unified memory across the CPU and GPU continues, it seems like that's going to be interesting that that's going to unlock an even more performance of, of you know, your personal computer. So I, I think that's kind of going to be the I don't know, making predictions about the future is always very dangerous, but I think that's going to be the case. Otherwise, I think it's going to be much of a, you know, SQL is still going to remain really important. Uh, I think R and Python will continue to grow. Uh, maybe we'll start to see some other new languages. Maybe Julia will kind of start to enter the, um, enter or increase in popularity where we see like a decent number of data scientists using it. Maybe some other language will come along, but ten years I think is a relatively, I don't know, it is a relatively short time in terms of computing in some ways, and a relatively long. I don't know. My my perspective has changed now. I think ggplot two is like fifteen years old, which is kind of like crazy to me, and it, it, you know it's had kind of bigger changes in its lifetime, but it's still like fundamentally the same thing. Like it's not like things maybe reshape and reshape. I think there's gonna always be like little tweaks of the way we the way we kind of um, access data and express what we're trying to do. But I, I don't know, I, I don't feel like there's any I feel like there's any real big changes on the horizon, except maybe for this just continued ability to to for your laptops to do, you know, really big data analysis. Okay, so I have a general. Okay, sorry, but go with this. Is. Thanks, Paul. Uh, I think I have a question just out of curiosity. Uh, what is your favorite package, and even what is your favorite function uh, that you in the tidyverse? I I think my favorite package is really dbplyr, which takes your dplyr code and translates it to SQL. And I think it's my favorite because it still kind of surprises me that, that it works uh, and that it is useful. Like obviously like most R code, you, there's no way you can convert it to SQL. Like it's just too far, but it turns out like so much of the code that you do when you're like doing data manipulation was like filtering or creating new variables. Like so much of that, you can actually basically express that in any programming language without that much difference. I think that to me is, I don't know, I just think that's, I just kind of love dbplyr because it like, it works. 
And the idea of this, sort of in general, I think the idea of dplyr backends is one of my better ideas because it seems to have just, it's really helped, I think, dplyr like both grow today, but also like continue to grow in the future. Like this idea of separating out how you describe the operations from how you perform them mean that like dplyr can basically, the way you use dplyr can basically stay the same even as the underlying computation engine like radically changes, whether it's like dplyr's own C++ code, where it's translating it to SQL, or it's using a uh, data table, or dtplyr, where it's like spreading the computation across multiple cores with multi dplyr. It just seems like it's a surprisingly effective uh, idea and makes me happy whenever I think about it. We have another Thanks. one from the audience. So uh, recently we have, we, ha we have been moving from traditional data formats uh, to things like graphs to describe interactions in, in social networks, uh, issues and problems of natural language processing. So in your opinion, what are the challenges in terms of new programming tools and statistical theory to handle this new kind of data? Yeah, I'm not super well posed to answer that question just because I've kind of decided like rectangular data is like my area of specialty. I think it, it's sort of interesting though, like how much, even with the kind of statistical methodology behind these things, like everything is still always powered by matrices. And so at some point you've got to get that data into a, some kind of rectangle. Um, so it's, it's sort of interesting to me that like, I don't know that that still matrices power every seem to power everything on the theory side. Um, so, and then there's the question of just like how do you efficiently kind of construct those matrices, or when you have matrices that are like very very sparse that are mostly just filled with zeros, are there better ways of representing that than as like an actual rectangle of so many rows and so many columns in memory? Um, but yeah, I don't I don't really know. That's sort of interesting to me too, like how just like the surprising effectiveness of the data frame or the, the matrix and how much, how many different types of data you can kind of like force into that shape and it still seems to be reasonably effective. Let me see, we have another one here. Uh, there's a huge segment of the market that use Excel as their main tool for straightforward data now. Well, I don't know that. Uh, how well do you think this tool serves it's neat. Yeah, so Excel is standard is, is interesting. Yeah. yeah. Would it survive? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Excel is, Excel is going to be around. I, I don't know. While, while humanity survives, something like Excel is going to exist. Uh, you know, partly because it's such a, you know, it's just such a great model. It's like so obvious, like everything that is there in front of you, you can kind of see it and interact with it. Uh, and then people use it for all sorts of things other than than, than data analysis. No, you can't be more rectangular than that, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, the, the, but the problem with Excel is like, it's, you know, fundamentally unreproducible. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's no way of telling, like, how did you end up with this, this, these numbers? It's very easy to like accidentally, you know, just sort one column of a table and just basically sort that one column instead of sorting all the, the other columns with it. And then if you don't notice that right away, it's kind of, gone um and then also people like you know one one group of people who have sort of talked to like from very different industries who have been, who have been so excited to learn r is like people who's like a big part of their job is like every month they get sent you know 20 different spreadsheets from different parts of the organization and their job is to like copy and paste the right parts of the spreadsheet into one like big giant spreadsheet. And that's- Yeah, what could know, go wrong, right? Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it's like, it's a frustrating job. It's like high stakes, you don't wanna make a mistake. And those people, when they learn like a little bit of programming and to automate that, like it gets rid of all of this, like this job that they hated doing and it runs it like so much faster. And they just, that's that's been a sort of a frequent source of like, big wins, turning people from Excel users into people who really love R. 
we have a technical question yeah, here. Oh, sorry. Um, to go just a it. follow up. I, I think that have that there's, there's something cultural in this matter as well, because uh, sometimes your boss doesn't understand R. Yeah. And it, you, it's hard to explain. Yes, you give me an input in Excel and I will give this up script. If you want to understand what happened in the midway, this is, this is the script. So I think uh, with time and culture, that can change. Absolutely. Yeah, so another super technical question here. If a memory leaks you, when you use C to write your libraries is an issue, is a frequent issue. How do you handle the risk of memory leaks? And if you have considered using the language Rust? Yeah, like I think fortunately, like most of the code we write in C like doesn't require that much like complicated memory allocation. Like often we, you know, we just ask R to make us a vector and then we fill that vector in. Um, there's certainly cases where it has caused problems and we've had like small memory leaks that have taken days or weeks to track down. Um, I think, you know, Rust is a, a definitely a solution, well, a, a possible solution to that. I think it's still a little tricky to get a Rust package on the CRAN. Uh, I know people have done it. I think it's mostly tricky out of un unfamiliarity. But just and Rust seems like an interesting, cool language, and I know some people on my team are playing around with it. But just making that, I don't know, that would be a big switch for us to go from C plus plus to to Rust. I'm not saying it wouldn't necessarily be worthwhile, but we just have to put a lot of a lot of time into it. So, Hadley, can you share your views on data privacy? We live in an era of when big tech kind of knows a lot of our about us our consuming habits and kind of things. What's your view on this? Yeah, I don't have any like, I don't know, kind of professional views on this, I guess, but like personally, it just seems pretty, I don't know, unappealing. Like I come from New Zealand, which has like very strong privacy laws um, for the US, which does not. Um, just like that, like, I don't know, there's just weird things, like this like, sort of idea of like identity theft which is sort of so easy in the US, basically because of like the data privacy laws are so sort of slack and it's very easy to get this information that allows you to impersonate another being. Like, I don't know, just, a, I, I find it's like worrying. Uh, it doesn't seem to be anything that I can do about it. Like personally uh, and I don't know. I think it's, and I think at the end of the day, like a lot of this data isn't actually that valuable. Like it's just, it's easier, like it's easy to use it for nefarious purposes than to live, to deliver real value for your business. And I think a lot of businesses should just like stop collecting it and they wouldn't be better off. But they've been sort of, there's just so many stories about the kind of like the magic of AI that if you just collect enough data and pour into some magical, artificial intelligence like you'll increase your profits and I don't know. yeah that's kind of okay yeah most of it Nothing. is just noise so yeah exactly <laughs> mr okay. Rico, uh we're reaching the one hour mark and we'd like to ask you if you have a little bit more time for uh, the last questions if you want to uh, yeah, close the... yeah unfortunately i have to run to a, another meeting so i guess so okay, the meaning of right. life question will have to be for another occasion right <laughs> <laughs> okay well thank you very much Hadley. i enjoyed uh we are very honored to have you here and thank you for uh arranging some time to talk to talk to us yeah thanks very much for having me bye everyone bye guys thank you very much bye